China's retaliatory measures against coal imports from Australia has backfired for many industries in China. Major manufacturing provinces such as Hunan and Jiangxi are experiencing tight restrictions on electricity consumption. Restrictions were applied in multiple cities. The factory of the world is now having its power shut down during the peak export season. Many Chinese people took to the internet to voice their opposition, but it was quickly silenced by officials. The tight supply of electricity was seen immediately on December 16th, after a ban on coal imports from Australia was announced. The government of Zhejiang province, one of China's richest provinces, first issued a notice requiring offices to turn on air conditioning and other heating equipment only when the temperatures reach below 3 degrees Celsius, and the set temperature must not exceed 16 degrees Celsius. At the same time, Hunan province also issued a notice that there is a relatively large gap in the supply of electricity this winter and spring, so the province will take a variety of power restrictions and other measures to alleviate the problem of power shortages. The Changsha City Development and Reform Commission issued an orderly power consumption initiative requiring all air conditioners in the city to be controlled below 20 degrees Celsius in winter and not to use high energy consuming appliances such as electric stoves and electric grills. In some parts of Hunan province, they even ordered the closure of traffic lights and street lights, triggering a public backlash. According to posts on Chinese social platforms, in Changsha City, a power outage occurred on the 17th, forcing some people to climb 30 floors to work because the elevators were down. Yiwu, China's largest production base for foreign trade products, became the main production site for supplies for China's pandemic control at the start of this year's COVID-19 outbreak. Some local manufacturers received notices that the government was asking them to save electricity and reduce working hours and that air conditioning was not allowed in some offices, factories, and malls throughout the day. As of December 18th, shops in at least five provinces have been asked to close early, restrict the use of lights on signs, ban the use of air conditioning or heating, and many small businesses and workshops have shut down. China, which relies heavily on coal for power generation, is also the world's largest importer of coal, mainly from Australia, from which it imported about 10 billion US worth of coal in 2019. According to the United Nations Commodity Trade Statistics database, it also shows that China imported more than 80 million metric tons of coal from Australia in 2018, more than double that of its second largest supplier, Indonesia. Meanwhile, the energy production efficiency of Australian coal mines exceeds the combustion efficiency of other countries, such as China, by 1.5 times, and that's why China loves Australian coal. Although China held a coal procurement meeting with Indonesia as early as November 25th, it seems to be unable to make up for the shortage of Australian coal. So why is China retaliating against Australia in this way? In fact, this is just one of the so-called economic sanctions that China has been imposing on Australia recently. The Chinese Ministry of Commerce has decided to impose temporary anti-dumping measures in the form of a bond on wine imports from Australia with a maximum tariff of 212% from November 28th. In addition, China also interrupted the Australian beef trade and imposed a huge 80% tariff on barley. Beijing has also asked Chinese people not to travel, work or study in Australia, calling Australia a racist country. On the other hand, China executed an Australian man in early December on drug smuggling charges, following a secret trial in June. In September, China also secretly arrested Australian Chinese journalist Cheng Lei and later used security threats to force the emergency evacuation of two Australian journalists. China is a country of uh, the rule of law, and I've got a question about a law that I've bumped up against since I moved to Beijing. Last weekend, and the weekend before, I tried to go to a park, and I'm told by the policeman there that there's a law that says, because I'm a journalist, I can't go to the park. Do you know about that law? I asked him on three different days, because I went three times and had the same experience. First, I go with a junior uh, policeman, looks at my passport, everything's fine, until they see that I've got a journalism visa. 
，他们会会去向有关的部门去询问、去了解。So I want to maybe you could you could you could study it, and, or or could you give me a form that says the foreign ministry of China gives me permission to go to the park. So when I go next weekend, I could go. You today ask this question, what is the purpose? Is it to solve your problem at the park, or is it to ask China whether it has the right to regulate journalists? What is the purpose? If you ask, your purpose is the first one. You want to go to the Chinese National Park, you can go to the Chinese National Park. 那你可以跟我的同事反映，我同事会尽可能的协助，向你提供协助。如果过程中遇到什么障碍，尽可能的帮你加以疏通。如果你提问的目的是在质疑中方是不是对外国记者有什么偏见，是不是没有依法治国，那我想你的出发点可能有点偏了。According to official Chinese statements, China's actions were in response to a series of politically motivated moves by Australia against China. These include the Australian government's request to investigate the source of the COVID-19 outbreak in China, its response to the U.S. Clean Network Initiative to ban Chinese company Huawei from building a 5G network in Australia, and the classification of Chinese Communist Party organizations in Australia as foreign agents. Moreover, on November 20th, the day after Australia and Japan signed their military cooperation agreement, the Chinese embassy in Australia released a document listing a series of 14 charges against Australia. Among them are the Australian government's support for anti-China research by think tanks, investigation of Chinese journalists in Australia, revocation of Australian visas for Chinese academics, criticism of China's action in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Xinjiang, calls for an international investigation into the source of COVID-19, banning Huawei from participating in Australia's 5G network, banning Chinese investment in Australia on national security grounds, and the Australian federal government's attempt to completely undermine the One Belt One Road Agreement between the Victorian government and China. In addition, a composite photo tweeted by Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian in early December supported an unsubstantiated rumor that Australian soldiers were suspected of murdering young men in Afghanistan. This sparked an international backlash. Australia's Prime Minister Morrison strongly condemned China's actions at the time, meanwhile demanding China's apology. It is also worth noting that it has now been three years since the country's two leaders met. A post made on an official Chinese government Twitter account, posted by the Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Li Jian Zhao. Is truly repugnant. It is deeply offensive to every Australian. The Chinese government should be totally ashamed of this post. It dis it diminishes them in the world's eyes. Now, after coal was banned from import, Australian Prime Minister Morrison said once again he was seeking clarification from Beijing and said if the policy was implemented, it would be a clear violation of World Trade Organization rules and a breach of mutual free trade agreements. We, along with many other countries, use these processes in the right and orderly way, and Australian industry should see this as being about Australia defending the values, operation, and interests. Of Australian producers, but doing so in a calm, methodical, and careful manner. In fact, Australia and China have another most important trade product, iron ore. But so far, neither China nor Australia has used iron ore as a bargaining chip for negotiations. It is because iron ore is seen as an important lifeline in the current economic and trade relations between the two countries. Australian media reported that an Australian senator suggested that the government should use iron ore as a countermeasure against China, but was not accepted by the federal government. Analysis suggests that Australia is still unable to completely cut off economic and trade ties with China because its economy is still highly dependent on China. China has been Australia's largest trading partner for the past 10 years, accounting for 32.6 percent of Australia's total exports. While Japan, Australia's second largest trading partner, accounts for less than half of China's trade. In 2019, China was buying more than half of the barley and 40 percent of the red wine produced in Australia, and it is also the largest buyer of Australian seafood, agricultural products, timber, iron ore, coal, and natural gas. 
Iron ore is a strategic national resource with military value. It is so important to Chinese steel companies that it will affect China's construction of infrastructure, aircraft, automobiles, ocean vessels, and its major export, metal products such as home appliances. China has been relying heavily on iron ore imports and has been acquiring mine sites and mining companies overseas in order to obtain a stable supply. From public information, it can be seen that China has acquired at least four Australian iron ore companies between 2008 and 2014. This approach will allow Sino-Australian joint ventures to be free from Chinese tariff burdens and ensure supply while bringing greater competitive pressure on Australian companies. For Australia, iron ore is currently an important pillar of the country's economy, and there is no way to find a buyer that can fully replace China in the short term. Some commentators have suggested that the Chinese Communist Party's current bet is that most Western countries will not try to provoke Beijing in the midst of the pandemic and economic downturn, so that they do not suffer the same losses as Australia. While judging from China's restrictions on Australian coal, it seems that the CCP's wolf warrior diplomacy has reached such a reckless level that people's livelihoods and the country's future development are no longer the primary concern. Back in 2018, when the Chinese Communist Party was negotiating a trade war with the United States, recognizing the economic and governance crisis, the Chinese Vice President Wang Kishan once stated, We, the people, can eat grass for a year without any problems, acknowledging the potential food crisis prompted by the trade war, but soon led to a wave of social panic and snapping up, and now many believe that the Chinese Communist Party will again not back down in its trade war with Australia, but leaving the people to bear the consequences. However, Australia is not alone. Some international alliances to resist the Chinese Communist Party are now underway, such as Quad, which includes the US, Japan, Australia, and India, whose foreign ministers met in October and directly addressed the threat from China and held joint military exercises in the Pacific in November. Our two great democracies face immediate crises like the COVID-19 pandemic and longer term challenges like the Chinese Communist Party's ambitions. We need to deal with each of these challenges simultaneously. At Osmin today, we discussed and reached agreement on a wide range of issues. We agreed it's essential that the Alliance remains well positioned to respond to both the immediate impacts of COVID-19 as well as the long, longer term economic and security challenges that have emerged not just in the past six months but in recent years. The Five Eyes have shown signs of revival in recent years too. The U.S. has established the Clean Network initiatives to avoid the cyber espionage activities of the Chinese Communist Party, and to date, 180 telecommunications companies in 53 countries have joined the initiative. On the issue of economic dependence, Australia has made some efforts this year. Australia has arranged a series of diplomatic events with allies such as the US, India and Japan and is also eager to pursue trade partnerships with Southeast Asian countries such as Indonesia and South Korea. After all, Australia is a democratic country and with the broad national and international support, even if it suffers in the short term, it can adapt in the long term.